um, to warm you up, I have a poll about spectral class. We talked about this last time. So just considering the G in our son's full spectral class, G2V, how do we assign that spectral class? How was it originally done? All right, I'm seeing answers across the board. That's okay. So when Annie Jump Cannon sorted out the spectral classes, she did this by spectral appearance. So that is how the spectral class is assigned, but it uh, does correlate with the temperature of the star. So if you answered temperature and we're thinking along those lines, that makes sense. Um, the spectral classes are then subdivided into numbers. So starting with the G, then we have the, for the sun, the G2, what does that mean? So which of these would be the hotter um, version of the G spectral class? Okay, I see most of you answering G0. And that's exactly right. So the, the G type, well, all the spectral classes are broken into uh, zero through nine. So zero being the hottest, nine being the coolest before you get into the next spectral class. And then finally, there's a third letter here. So the sun's full type is G2V and the, um, the G is the spectral class assigned by the spectral lines corresponding to temperature. Two just ranks it relative to the other G type stars. And then the V gives us its luminosity class. And this is actually where this spectral class hits the HR diagram, because this is grouped by the type of star in the different categories. So 1A and 1B are supergiants, 2, 3, and 4 are giants, and then 5 is our main sequence stars. Notice there's no luminosity class here for the white dwarfs. They are left out. So um, I want to illustrate this a bit. So we can actually take our G type star. And if I wanted to know, you know, where is a G2V star on the HR diagram, then I would have to say, okay, well, I know how to find the G type star. I just find that based on the, um, this, the stellar class. And then the G2 star is just a, a small slice of that somewhere toward the hot end of the G category. And then the V tells me that it must be a main sequence star. So that means that the only star on this particular diagram that could be G2V is this one that meets that intersection of the G2 um, spectral class and the V luminosity class. All right, so the V luminosity class, the main sequence spans a lot of different stars. And the reason for that is because they, they, those stars are all kind of behaving the same. Um, they're all in their kind of normal adult life. Okay, um, so the supergiant stars and actually also the giant stars are subdivided into more refined luminosity classes. Um, and these are by, uh, you know, brightness. So for that reason, would that mean that they have to be split horizontally or vertically into those subclasses? All right, so since these are subdivided by luminosity and the luminosity is plotted on the y-axis, then the subdivision has to be a, the um, kind of the horizontal or the vertical split. So that uh, the, I guess, 1A supergiant stars are toward the top of the luminosity range and the 1B are toward the bottom of the luminosity range. And we can actually put all these, um, you know, luminosity classes on the HR diagram in kind of a more visual format. Um, and they would read from most luminous to least luminous if you read from one to five, basically. So you'd have your 1A and 1B supergiants followed by your two, three, and your four giants and subgiants. And then finally, the main sequence is um, type V. All right. So those are the luminosity classes and um, you know, the sun is a G2V star, but there's lots of other type stars. You could have an you know, M1B, which would be a very cool um, supergiant star. Maybe you would have a, I don't know, F1A, which would be a hotter than the sun and much more luminous supergiant. So these luminosity classes are the way that you can figure out where on the HR diagram would a particular star live or given its number or, you know, given its location, what would its class be? 
Okay, it's just a handy shorthand. So you can tell the temperature and the brightness of stars based on those letters. All right, so let's test this idea out. Let's say we have a K82 star. Which one of these could possibly be a K82? Um, yeah, if I, if I highlight the entire K category, then that excludes immediately star B and star D. I know the eight is on the cool side of all the K stars. So the K8 must be somewhere in this region. And then the two category is my, not my supergiant, that's one, but my giant category, which is this you know, second blob of stars. So C is the right location to be a K82 type star. All right. So um, that's just how stellar class relates to the HR diagram. And uh, there's one other really useful thing that we can do using the HR diagram and using these luminosity classes. And it kind of goes back to our discussion of how we can figure out the distance to stars based on their luminosity and their apparent brightness. So the idea is, let's say that I know that I have a K type star because I, I look at its stellar spectra and you know, based on what Annie Jump Cannon taught us, uh, we can see which stellar, or which stellar class a star is based on that spectrum. So if I know that a star is in a K type spectrum um, and then I know its luminosity class, whether it's a very large star, uh, which is some, uh, there's a, again, a, a spectral way to figure out whether a star is a giant star or a main sequence star. So let's say that I know independently its spectral class and I can figure out its luminosity class then if I know the apparent brightness is the same for all these three stars, which one would be closer? All right, I'm seeing the most votes for C and that's exactly right. So if they all look like they're the same brightness, uh, but C uh, is the least luminous star and we know it is based on its spectrum telling us that it's in a V rather than a two or a one luminosity class. Um, then it means that C has to be the closest star. It's got the least wattage, but it looks just as bright as the high wattage stars. So this whole method is called spectroscopic parallax, um, which is kind of a silly term. The part spectroscopic is because of course we use the spectral class to find the stellar temperature and we use the uh, spec also the spectrum to find out the luminosity class so that's where the spectroscopic comes from. The parallax is misleading and it's only called spectroscopic parallax because parallax is you know, the other method that we use to measure the distance to stars. And since the actual parallax method, um, you know, based on the shift of stars on the sky uh, when we're in different parts of our orbit around the sun, since that is only useful for very nearby stars, this is a really powerful method to measure the distances out to uh, stars that are farther away, but still within the Milky Way galaxy.